بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. As you may know, at Renovatio, we always try to find scholars who are grounded in a faith tradition, whether it's Islam or any other faith, and who can then bring that faith tradition and apply it to the moral and ethical challenges we all face in our culture today, in the Western culture particularly. And so today's topic is actually very much fits that vision of Renovatio. Um, we chose a rather provocative title, as you may know, Do What Thou Wilt. It's not a statement, it's a question, <laughs> just to be clear about that. Um, the statement was actually made by an occultist named Alistair Crowley. Um, and it seems that, you know, a lot of the, that statement define, defines a lot of the zeitgeist out there today in the modern culture, um, especially in the West. So we hope to have a discussion about what the 20th century uh, philosopher Isaiah Berlin um, termed positive and negative freedom or liberty, uh, which is the interference or non-interference to individual self-determination and whether, how that positive and negative freedom maps to Islamic philosophy and other pre-modern traditions and how it maps to liberalism, which is the modern um, tradition we live in right now. In other words, we hope to answer a few questions. I'm gonna just give two or three overarching questions that we hope um, will, be, will be addressed today. Um, the question, first question is, is it as simple as saying that the traditional approach to <coughs> Uh, represents freedom from sin, and uh, is it simple or too simplistic to say that, as well as to say that the modern approach um, represents freedom to sin? Um, does true personal freedom require self-discipline or self-mastery? Or does it mean, well, do what thou wilt, uh, with no constraints at all on freedom? In other words, is it okay to do whatever we want as long as we don't harm anyone else? Lastly, how do we as believers in a living God navigate and abide by our, abide by our teachings of theology and ethics and still authentically participate in modern culture and society? So we've brought together three uh, individuals who have given these topics a lot of thought in their own perspective in their own interest areas of, of study. And the format is very simple. Um, I will introduce each one of them. They'll come up and <clears throat> take their seat here. And then they'll have a conversation for the next hour or so, and then we'll be done. And uh, uh, after that, I'll come back to just thank people, but that's about it. So let me introduce our special guests, uh, three of them. I'll, <clears throat> I'll begin with Mohammed Fadal, who is a professor of law at the University of Toronto and the former Canada Research, Research Chair for the Law and the Economics of Islamic Law. His research areas include business corporations, economic analysis of law, Islamic law, and political philosophy and theory. He has published numerous articles in Islamic legal history and Islam and liberalism, and has also edited and translated the Mawatta of Imam Malik, which is available at our bookstore. I think they still have some copies, and it's the first, which is the first uh, written treatise of Islamic law. So I would, with that, I'd like to invite Muhammad Fadl to come join us on stage. Please give him a warm welcome. Uh, next up is Hassan Spiker. Um, he's a philosopher and a comparative scholar of Islamic, Greek, and modern thought, and a recent addition to Zaytuna College's faculty, where he currently teaches philosophy and logic. He has studied the works of Plotinus, Dionysius, the Areopagite, if I'm pronouncing that right, Areopagite, <laughs> sorry, and Kant and Hegel at the University of Cambridge, where he received his master's in philosophy and is completing his doctoral studies. He also studied the Islamic sciences, focusing on the school of Ibn Arabi and the late Kalam theology in the Middle East for several years. And his new book, relevant to our discussion today actually, is titled, Hierarchy and Freedom, 
and the subtitle is An Examination of Some Classical, Metaphysical, and Post-Enlightenment Accounts of Human Autonomy, and will be released shortly. So please welcome Hassan Spiker. Now I want to introduce our moderator for the evening, um, who has traveled here all the way from the United Kingdom to be here with us today. Paul Williams uh, studied philosophy and theology at the University of London, and is a creator of blogging theology, which I hope a lot of you are familiar with. If you aren't, just Google it. Um, it's a popular YouTube channel, <clears throat> which introduces academic and scholarly content to comparative religion, especially concerning the Abrahamic faiths. His guests include leading scholars in biblical studies, Islamic and Christian theology, and the philosophy of science from the universities of Oxford, Cambridge, Yale, Princeton, and Zaytuna College. He's had at least, I think, three or four of our faculty members on more than once to discuss topics. So Paul has come here all the way from the United Kingdom, so please give him a Bay Area welcome. Assalamu alaikum, uh, everyone. Uh, this is the Islamic greeting, uh, which simply means peace be upon you. The word freedom conveys quite different shades of meaning depending on its context. Many people are inspired by movements dedicated to freedom, sometimes freedom from the shackles of authoritarian regimes. But most often in Western liberal societies, Many jealously guard the freedom to live and act, guided by their own consciences alone. When we sit in our places of worship, we're often reminded about the necessity of self-discipline, of constraining the freedom of our lower selves, and about how unchecked freedom, be it sexual or economic, can easily degenerate into licentiousness to the do-what-thou-wilt creed of the English Satanist, I'm afraid to say, um, Alistair Cambridge. Crowley. Was from he Cambridge. in Cambridge? Yeah. Gosh, that's, that's two, two people from Cambridge here today. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, this, not surprisingly, can so often lead to our degradation and downfall. Not the Cambridge bit, but the do-what-thou-wilt bit. Being from Britain, yeah. So, so what we need uh, urgently, I would suggest, is an understanding of freedom that allows us to direct ourselves and our societies toward an authentic common good. Today I'm delighted to moderate what promises to be a fascinating hour of discussion between two distinguished scholars being introduced, Mohammed and Hassan, uh, who have thought deeply about freedom and its role in the world. And I'd like to begin by asking each of you uh, gentlemen the same question. Is our great modern stress on individual moral autonomy and freedom, with its philosophical roots in the European Enlightenment, and especially in John Locke's uh, ethics, at all compatible with an Islamic worldview? Can there be a synthesis, perhaps, or are they simply irreconcilable paradigms with different metaphysical foundations? So I don't know who wants to go first, maybe Mohammed. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, it's a really important question, and I'd like to you know, caveat my answer by saying I'm, I'm not really a philosopher. I'm a, a law professor. I'm a lawyer. Um, I dabble in, on the margins of philosophy just because of my interest in political theory. Um, so everything I say should be taken with a grain of salt in that regard. Um, you know, I think one of the questions, or how to answer the question, is going to depend on what you mean by the Islamic tradition, mm. first of all. <clears throat> For me, um, I tend to view the Islamic tradition as sort of the product of kalam, you know, scholastic theology, um, and sort of fiqh and fiqh, and uh, 
you know, a certain kind of sober Sufism, I would say. Um, and from that perspective, right, I think there are a lot of important points of overlap. Mm. Um, you know, if we start from the Kalam tradition, the Kalam tradition begins with the assumption that we are individuals, first of all, right? We, we start as individuals. We're not, we, we don't know as a member of a community. We know as individuals. Uh, we are born knowing nothing, tabula rasa, like, like Locke says, mm. and we acquire knowledge through deliberation and experience, right? So we learn about everything by applying our reason to the data that our senses provide to us, right? So there's also a very strong strain of empiricism in Islamic theology. Mm. And quite significantly, uh, the mutakallimun say that the only route to knowledge of God, which is our first obligation, is through the use of reason. Right. So uh, taqlid, deference, deference to the going opinion, is not a valid way of knowing God and is not going to be effective on the day of judgment, right? So I think the Islamic tradition has a very strong rationalist bent to it, a very strong commitment to the idea of the use of deliberative reason to uh, undergird true conviction, right? Um, and that uh, we have to acquire knowledge through learning and, and, and struggle, mm. which I think is, is a very, you know, which is an important point, common point with the, with the European Enlightenment, yes. um, particularly the English Enlightenment. Yes. Um, now, how that goes, because, you know, the, the, the European Christians didn't have the benefit of the Quran, right? They didn't have the benefit of the Islamic revelation. So it goes in a different direction because it doesn't have the discipline of revelation that Muslims have. So, I mean, I think the great advantage that Muslims offer is that we have a strong commitment to rationalism combined with a revelation that allows for a certain kind of check in situations where the conclusions of reason are equivocal and therefore can result in error, right? And so that's what makes, I think, um, Islam unique as a tradition is that it's, it's got, it really has both very well rooted in its tradition, right? And that's why I think it provides a kind of um, balanced approach to the problems of freedom, which we so you, you perhaps more as a compa compati compatibilist approach. Yes. The two are compatible rather than... In, uh, not just compatible, but thoroughly integrated. Really? Right. right? So in, in Islam, revelation cannot be justified without reason, mm -hmm. right? Because how do you know something is revelation, right? You can only know that it's revelation through the exercise of your independent reason. Your independent reason recognizes, recognizes God, recognizes the possibility of revelation, and then recognizes the truth of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, through reason, not through some kind of, you know, road to Damascus kind of revelation, right? This is, you know, very important, yeah. right? So, um, Reason is at the heart of all Islamic disciplines. Okay, okay. well, fair enough. Hassan, what would be your view? Um, well, thank you very much. First of all, just a quick proviso. I'm, I'm uh, as uh, Professor Fuddle mentioned, and I'm sure he was um, just being humble, but I really am a dabbler, so I just wanted to say that. <laughs> um, second of all, I'm shocked to actually be in the presence of Paul because I thought he was just on oh. TV. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is amazing. But, this is um, English humour, by the way, so... Uh, <laughs> well, we're, we're enjoying very English um, weather at the moment. It so is very, very familiar, I must we're say. We're feeling at home, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, a statement that I went back to today and that I've always thought was one of the most important things I've ever read by a modern philosopher. Um, Alaa Wahua was the... Uh, it's a quotation from a very famous intellectual historian um, I believe he's still at Princeton, but his name's Robert Pippin. Um, and he's one of the great historians, philosophical historians of modernity or historians of the philosophy of modernity, or I'm not sure what you'd say exactly, but um, he says, the assertion of autonomy is the deepest assumption in modernity's self-understanding. But I take the 
um, most fundamental figure to be Kant, Immanuel Kant. There are obviously many other very fundamental, important figures. Locke is, Locke is one of the most important. Um, and I think that um, freedom is certainly a noble concept, but it's, it's certainly not, you know, it's an, it's an equivocal term. It's, we may think that it means just one thing, um, but actually it means very, very definite things according to the particular philosophy you, you, have to, you happen to subscribe to, your particular environment, your particular fundamental assumptions. I personally believe that we have the concept and the, the principle has deteriorated in our times um, for the most part, such that I think Brad Gregory, the great Catholic historian, again, philosopher and historian, um, sums it up. He says in his brilliant book, The Unintended Reformation, that the supreme value in modern liberal societies is free choice per se, right, which might be uncontroversial. The supreme value in modern society, modern liberal societies is free choice per se, regardless of what is chosen. That's the key part, regardless of what is chosen. Yeah. And I believe this is the point that has to be cleared up before we can discuss whether broad, obviously it's very broad, broad modern liberal conceptions of freedom and an, a, a truly Islamic conception of freedom can be compatible. I think in principle they could be compatible. But that problem has to be cleared up, which I, I consider to be arbitrarism, which is the idea that there are metaphysical and epistemological assumptions underlying the modern, broad modern attitude towards freedom, which makes it free choice regardless of what it's chosen. It's not, and that's not, a, that's not giving you choice, that's dogmatic, because that's saying, if you have a criterion, that's a problem. As soon as you have a criterion which you think is an objective criterion, that becomes a problem. Somehow that's hampering yeah. free choice. And that's been a criticism of Kant, isn't it, in his view of ethics, that is kind of without any contents. It's devoid of moral, the actual content of the moral choice. It's just an abstraction. Yeah, yeah I think you can universalize transgender rights. As a, mm. I don't think there's anything. That's precisely the problem with Kant's, that many point, people have pointed out about Kant's ethics is that the categorical imperative doesn't have any content. Exactly. It doesn't give you any criterion yeah. whatsoever. So it's, it's actually, in practice, it's fairly useless, as some people would say. Anyway. Now, in your new book, Hierarchy and Freedom, which I've had a sneak preview of, thank you mm -hmm. very much, has, um, it's not published yet, but it's out soon. No, it is it? published, but it's, oh, it in, is? Yeah, it's in press at the moment. Oh, in, in the I missed the. Yeah. I missed the you discuss in that book uh, what you call, and I quote uh, from the, uh, towards the beginning, the following. The vexed uh, philosophical and historical relationship between hierarchy, because you put these in quotes, and freedom in the West. Freedom, although at least in principle a noble word, has become the mother of all banalities in today's culture. Ubiquitous but strictly never to be defined, and everywhere employed by wisely, wisely wagging heads, it's great prose this, to warrant multifarious species of arbitrary and unprincipled human behavior. The word hierarchy, contrarily, is inexorably prone in Western contemporary society to elicit strong negative reactions. So, down with hierarchy in the West. And these are strong words, that's the end quote, uh, Hassan. Could you expand a bit uh, about what you mean in that paragraph? I think it gets to the essence of, that's what you've just said before, actually. Absolutely. Um, I, well, this is very interesting because um, looking into the history of, of this a little bit in the process of, of writing the book, it, it was just, I found it intriguing, the fact that coupled with the Enlightenment's insistence that freedom was the supreme value and that they were uniquely freeing mankind from you know, bondage, being uh, bound and, and um, imprisoned by so-called authority of, of all sorts of different types of authority. Even reason, actually, was a type of capital A authority that they didn't like. Um, but certainly the divine right of kings and, and church hierarchies and things like that. Um, but Precisely, you know, freedom was bound up almost irreducibly with the dismantling of hierarchy, as in it was the sin qua non. If you want to have freedom, you have to dismantle the hierarchy. That was the basic understanding, yeah. um, which you broadly find. 
Um, and this has also been pointed out beautifully by Charles Taylor. It's been beautifully pointed out by, um, by Robert Pippin as well. I think it was mostly drawing on Charles Taylor. That um, the dismantling of the hierarchy was, was part and parcel of the assertion of autonomy and the assertion of freedom. Um, however, what I feel is that when you look at what I've argued in the book is that when you analyze various Enlightenment thinkers and their attitude towards um, hierarchy and what it means to them, it's actually they're very much missing the mark when it comes to what did, if you look at the intellectual pedigree of the notion of hierarchy, they are assuming, broadly speaking, of course, they assume, generally assume that all hierarchy must be conventional and ultimately arbitrary, right? And that's true. I mean, you know, isn't it convenient that we're all here, um, but one of us just decides that, you know, there's a hierarchy and I happen to be at the, the head of the hierarchy um, and, you know, I'm going to appoint my close friends around me. They're, they're going to be the next rung in the hierarchy and, you know, the people we don't like are going to eventually be at the lowest rate. Of course, that, that sounds awful, and that is an impediment to freedom. But the point is, the traditional under metaphysical understanding of hierarchy has nothing to do with that whatsoever. It's an understanding that embedded in being, there is an intrinsic hierarchy. The most fundamental aspect of that is simply the superiority of intellect to instinct. Right? And so, insofar as human groups and societies and associations genuinely participate in that real metaphysical hierarchy, then there is a real me metaphysical hierarchy there. But it's ultimately an inward hierarchy. It's not ultimately an outward hierarchy. And very interesting, mm. interestingly, even in medieval um, tracts like Giles of Rome's tract on political theory, you know, they say you know, the, the Pope is the head of the hierarchy in an outward sense, he's actually not necessarily holier than anyone else. You would, you would hope that he is because he is the outward symbol of that hierarchy, but it's possible for him to not be. Um, and so, essentially, you know, the, 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 these theories of hierarchy were, I'm giving you a bit of a long-winded answer, but you know, they, were, they, were, they were rooted in a very famous, very major um, sixth century figure, his writings, Dionysius the Areopagite, who's usually known as Pseudo-Dionysius. Um, and he was possibly an actual student of the Neoplatonist philosopher Proclus, or, but he was definitely strongly influenced by him, sometimes almost paraphrasing him. Um, and you know, it's, it's, Dionysius is the key figure here because he's the first great theorizer of this idea of metaphysical intrinsic hierarchy. And he was the one, because he was a great medieval authority, who was invoked in order to justify the idea that this intrinsic metaphysical hierarchy is mirrored in the orders of society. All right. right. But as I've said, there's this fundamental modernist assumption that, oh, that somehow hampered social mobility. There are a lot of interesting studies. I invite you to go and have a look at them, you know, which you know, pretty categorically prove that there was more social mobility in the Middle Ages than there is today. Really? Yeah. So... You know, it's just interesting that we, we are, we've inherited a certain narrative about, um, very often it's a Protestant narrative about the, the emergence of modernity and, the, and the, 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 the wonderful good that modernity has, has brought us as, as, a, as a human race. Um, on the other hand, you know, there are problems with the broad Catholic narrative of the, the emergence of modernity. One, one can't really be a, a blind follower in in either of them. But just to bring in uh, a hadith, if I, I may, to bring in uh, faith here, um, I have a, an amazing Sahih hadith in Bukhari where the Prophet Muhammad, upon peace, said, and I think this is germane to your point, indeed, each of you is a shepherd and each of you is responsible for their flock. The ruler is a shepherd over the people and is responsible for his subjects. A man is a shepherd over his family and is responsible for them. A woman is a shepherd over her husband's home and children and is responsible for them. Now, for me, as a, a non, absolutely non-scholar, not knowing, you know, I'm not giving a fat or anything, I'm just saying that strikes me as intrinsically hierarchical and is not merely conventional in its understanding of the 
the, the, the relationship between uh, the subordinate or, and so on. Uh, did that, would you agree with that or am I? I think any traditional society believes in an intrinsic hierarchy. A right. lot of uh, <clears throat> modernists believe in an intrinsic hierarchy. But there is a bad form of hierarchy, which is arbitrary hierarchy. Or, or abusive hierarchy. Or abusive hierarchy, or right. one that's not really rooted in reality. And the thing right. is, that's why I believe it, it's always really a hidden hierarchy. There right. is a hierarchy, but you don't necessarily know who it is. But there are symbols of that. There, is a, there's a, there are representatives of that hierarchy who can be good or bad representatives right. thereof. Right. So yes, there is the father, the head of the household, there, there is the mother with her particular extremely important role, um, right. largely more important than the father's. There is the relationship between children and, and their parents. Um, but people can do a bad job. But it doesn't mean that there isn't a fundamental intrinsic hierarchy. Right. Okay, before we come to the next question, sorry, um, Mohammed, do you want to comment yeah, on what we were saying? I'd like to comment, you know, I think that Hadith is often uh, cited in support of a kind of natural hierarchy. I mean, I, I don't think it's that simple if you start right. looking at Islamic law. Okay. Right now, of course, there are, you know you can't universalize about Islam because there are lots of different traditions in Islam. So if you look at Shiism, Shiism I think is a very hierarchical tradition. Right, it posits a kind of yeah. sacred family, um, quite literally. Yeah. Right, and it attributes all sorts of kind of superpowers to them. Yeah. Um, Sufism is also a hierarchy of yeah. of charismatic religious knowledge. Um, at least in, in many in many in many forms, but fiqh is surprisingly flat. <laughs> okay, I mean, like really, like really flat. Um, so, so what do you mean by flat? I mean, I mean I, I like I no hierarchy. Right. Okay. Like I mean, there are, there are, there are gender hierarchies, right? Yeah. Um, but among free men, let's just put it this way, in the Middle Ages, it's remarkably flat. So. Uh, Abu Bakr al Kastani, who's a 12th century Hanif, great Hanafi jurist, he refers to the caliph as a rasul. Now, in, 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 in Hanafi fiqh, a rasul is the lowest form of, mess, of, of, of agent that you can have. It's like an errand boy. Right? So he speaks of the caliph as like the community's errand boy. Right? Um, so, you know, Ibn Abd al Salam, when he's talking about duties of obedience, he says the principle, the, 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 the foundational rule in Islam is that nobody owes a duty of obedience to anybody else because of <laughs> this sort of fundamental nature of, of, of equality among, among humans, that there has to be a legal cause imposing uh, duties of obedience, right? So o obedience is constructed in Sunni Islam, political theory. That's why I'm saying, again, that's what makes it very, I think, um, similar to 17th century English Enlightenment thought. Yeah. Because this is the great contribution of, of Hobbes and Locke was the idea that you could construct political authority, that political authority wasn't given to you, mm. right? It was a product of human deliberation and choice and design. And so if you, again, if you look at fiqh books and they talk about the duty of developing what I call the rule of law, iqamat al-hukm, um, it's something that's delegated to the ruler the ruler is given the responsibility of designing institutions that makes the law effective. And when the ruler doesn't do it, it devolves to the people to do it, right? Um, so again, this is where I'm saying there's this balance in Islam between sort of freedom slash autonomy and norms that are outside of their control. So we, are, we have the freedom to create our institutions, but those institutions must vindicate certain kinds of norms. Right? So we're not, it's not a license to do what you wish, no. but nor is it something in which everything is determined for you. Okay. Well, perhaps we can uh, move on to uh, another area of uh, contemporary, a uh, uh, sort of red button issue, really. And there's a question for uh, you, Mohammed. Um, is uh, contemporary liberalism in the tradition of John Locke and J.S. Mill? Uh, to Englishmen again, um, compatible with the Islamic worldview. Now, I have in mind particularly the question of sovereignty mm -hmm. in Islam uh, and the liberal worldview. Um, just to give an example, some newly developed um, liberal concepts uh, regarding gender and sexuality 
are seen as essential to liberal ethics these days. And ethical conformism is obligatory in many liberal democracies. It certainly is becoming that way in England and, and some other European countries. I'm less sure of what's going on in the United States, however. Um, so some would suggest that there's no consensus possible between these two worldviews, Islam and the liberal worldview, in, the, in this kind of emerging new social order that we're now forced to participate in, in a way. Uh, the outlooks, some would say, are too radically different and incompatible. Is that the case now? We're moving beyond Locke now into some kind of new understanding of liberalism, which does present a tension with Islam. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to, you know, think of Locke and Mill in one sentence because I think they're very, very different kinds of thinkers. Um, and I would also sort of agree with Hassan, I mean, in the sense that... El I'm not sure I would even call much of what we say today as liberalism yeah. as opposed to just yeah. licentiousness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think Mill, I never think of Mill as a licentious figure. No. Um, Mill, Mill understood the idea of higher goods and that there were certain things that were worth pursuing more than others, yeah. right? And I think what we see today, ironically, is despite the lip service to freedom that we hear all the time, we live in a most unfree society. Yes, yes. In the sense that so much of our lives are determined by the logics of economic necessity. Mm. Most human beings don't have much choice about anything because the market is dictating everything for them. Mm. And I think that's one reason why sexual freedom has become so important in modern culture because it's the <laughs> only domain in which the average person feels any kind of ability to govern himself or herself. Mm. Um, and so it's not really a philosophical problem, it's a kind of sociological or anthropological problem that arises from the hyper-capitalism in which we live, in which there's no room for any other kind of freedom. Mm. Um, and as a result, um, the only way people can experience any self-government is in their intimate lives. Mm. And so they resent anybody talking about it because th nothing else is available to them, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of my, my, under my own pop psychology explanation <laughs> of what's yeah, going on yeah, because yeah. otherwise it's very hard for me to make sense of it, honestly. Yeah. Um, but in terms, and, in terms of a, a Muslim response... Right, and so again, I think Islamically, this is where I think Islam has a balance that Western culture lacks is that we have an idea of privacy that is extremely important. So we have boundaries. I mean, the, right? this is a really important point. Could you just explain to some people in the audience who may not be aware of what is particularly Islamic about the, the privacy realm and the public realm? Because it's a very important distinction, isn't it? In yes. The world view, so, which we don't really have in the West so much these days. So in, 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 in traditional Islamic ethics, I, you know, let me just say, Islam is a heteronormative religion. I mean, a lot of people will, will not like that, but it clearly is a heteronormative religion. Um, on the other hand, Islam also is a religion that respects people's privacy yeah. and, 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 and teaches, Islam teaches Muslims not to pry into people's private, intimate lives, yes, yes. right? And it, it allows for a certain kind of sociological balance yeah. to, to, to exist in which sexual minorities can exist without persecution, while at the same time, you know, the, the, the ethical ideals can be maintained for the reproduction of society. I mean, I would say everybody, no matter what their sexual orientation is, has an interest in healthy heteronormativity because that's what reproduces society. <laughs> that's how they exist, yeah. I mean, so even if so you're not that, heterosexual... That's how they exist. Even if you're not heterosexual, you don't want heteronormative ideals to break down because that will destroy the society in which you, you are in. Although that right? is the objective of many activists today, is precisely um, to destroy and, that. And so, um, but the, the problem in Western societies is no respect for limits. Right. right? <clears throat> so, you know, I just know growing up, my God, the kind of um, abuse that would be hurled on someone who was suspected of being a sexual minority was horrific, yeah. right? Because again, there's no, there's no boundaries, yeah. right? And so once that's flipped over, it goes to the other extreme, yes. right? So the view is the only way we can protect sexual minorities is to eliminate any kind of normativity around sexual ethics. 
right? Because otherwise the fear is if we have any kind of normative sexual ethics, we're back to the old days of sexual persecution. Right. So there's no, they, there's no ability to be balanced. There's the way no that I think is, it's all yeah, reactive for the pendulum the way, swinging back and forth. You know, I think Islam offers a way to balance these two different goals, presenting persecution based on sexual orientation while maintaining some kind of sex, ideal of sexual normativity. Yeah, I mean, this plays back to what you were saying about uh, the Kantian ethics being contentless, devoid of uh, any, any content. And there's a wonderful verse in the uh, Quran, which I'm not going to mention in Arabic, but in the English translation. Uh, you are indeed the best community that has ever been brought forth mm. for the good of mankind. You enjoin the doing of what is right and forbid the doing of what is wrong. And you believe in God. It's the Quran, uh, the third surah. Uh, verse 110 in the Muhammad Asa translation. And I think that's just wonderful because there you do have some content, at least the sense of a moral content rather than just an individualistic free for all. And, and that's in the DNA of what it is to be a Muslim in a, in a, in a social context as, a, as an ethical individual. Uh, I think that's just a very beautiful verse. I'd absolutely agree with um, Dr. Muhammad about uh, the flatness of, in terms of governance and, right. and in terms of fiqh in, in um, in Islamic civilization, I think that's a very important and laudable thing. I'm, I'm reminded of the story of Sayyidina Umar um, when the son of the governor of Egypt had had a race with um, a copt and uh, the copt had, had beaten him um, in the race. I think it was a horse race, it must have been a horse race. And, and you know, he, he got, you know, he, he was ashamed and embarrassed in front of his friends and and he thought, well, I'm the son of the ruler and I'm a Muslim. And he, he actually started beating this, this copt. Um, oh, really? Yeah, Gosh. with a stick. And this got back to Sayyidina Umar, who summoned the, uh, the, the, gov the, the, the son and the father, um, the governor of Egypt, and had the son publicly, publicly whipped um, in front of everyone for, for that transgression. So Gosh. there was absolutely no sense of a hierarchy that you know, somehow yeah. he was immune um, because of his political status or something like that. The, the Sharia was absolutely yeah. uh, applicable to all. Um, and I think really the, the important thing is when you know, weighing up, well, the relevance of Locke and, and Mill. You know, Mill has a harm principle, um, and we have a harm principle. Um, you, know, you might talk about the five necessities in our... Um, Dean, which are just to listen well, to well, which are uh, the the preservation of life, the yeah. preservation of of uh, lineage, uh, of, of lineage, yeah. the the pre pre uh, preservation of Dean, yeah. um, uh, the pre preservation of um, Pro property, of property, and uh, intellect, and intellect. Yeah, yeah. I got the, the order completely wrong. That's why it didn't come out right. <laughs> it starts with intellect. We got there at the end. Yeah, it? I got the, <laughs> well with with doctor's uh, help, but. Um, in any case, so we have, we have a harm principle, you know, the, 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 the structures of governance and legislation are there to protect um, these absolutely crucial and important elements of human life. Um, but I think the, the issue with someone like uh, Mill, I think Mill's a complete genius, by the way. I think that, you know, he's an empiricist and he basically on almost every single philosophical position, you know, I disagree with him, um, for whatever that's worth, but I, I acknowledge that he's a, a complete genius, and he's very fair-minded, unusually, for, you know, for someone on the, on the other side, as it were. You know, he has an amazing um, uh, essay called an, an essay on Bentham and Coleridge. Yeah, I'm not sure I, if I may disagree mm. with you there. I, I mean, right. uh, Jess I mean, Mill wrote On Liberty. I'm referring to that particular book, this utilitarian work. Uh, and mm. yeah, he is fair minded when it comes to English people. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, I agree with you. No, I, I know what you're referring to. But yeah. he was living in an era of colonialism when yes. England just happened, I'm sorry, to, to rule the world. Yeah. Mm. And this balance, this uh, noble ethic did not extend to the rest of the world. He and that's says not, despot, despotism is a legitimate yeah. form of government yes. when dealing with Exa barbarians. That's yeah. a yeah. quote from J.S. Mill. Yeah. And the reason sadly. I say this is not me yeah. being hard on J.S. Mill. He himself says this. Yeah, he I'm, says this ethic is only really for Englishmen. Okay. 
So that's why I'm pushing no, back on what you that, said. That's a different issue, but it's, of course, extremely problematic. We'd have no difference of opinion on condemning that. But, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of his breadth of knowledge and his fair-mindedness, yes, yeah. even though he takes a, a position that I'm, I don't agree with. But um, it's interesting that the harm principle and rules is um, broad um, philosophy uh, are, are two of the only philosophies that you'll actually find cited in courts of law today. They're seen as being sufficiently neutral um, to actually be principles that somehow transcend the idea that there is this separation between law and, and objective morality. Yes. Um, and uh, I'm sure Dr. Fuddle would be able to qualify that or no, no, it's, I think, I, think it's, uh, I, I just wanted to, I'm glad you brought up Rawls. Um, one, one, one thing that's very, I mean, I'd like to point out, again, in furtherance of my claim that a lot of what goes under the rubric of liberalism today is really just licentiousness. Yes, I think it's a very, 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 it's a very profound point. We'll come back to this in a second, we may, about the idea, because the subtitle here is freedom from sin or freedom to so, sin, which so, ties into so what So Rawls, for example, in, in political liberalism, absolutely the emphasize, emphasizes the indispensability of what Republicans call civic virtues. Right. So you can't have a democratic, a liberal democratic state in the way that Rawls envisions it without cultivating certain positive virtues in the citizenry. Right. And this is, I think, one of the great problems that we have today is because our understanding of freedom is so, is so impoverished yeah. that we've lost the ability to understand that you know, things like truth and the commitment to truth a commitment to reasoned argument, a commitment to honesty, all these things are not things that people are born with. It has to be cultivated, yes. right? And one of the ironies, I think, of Rawls is that Rawls assumes he has a very so specific... Who is Rawls? Could you oh, John Rawls is. is like the most famous liberal philosopher in the post-war era. And his important contribution is he gave a sort of moral account of democracy at a time when utilitarian theories had totally dominated the field. Um, but one of the things that's very important in his theory of the stability of democracies or the possibility of the stability of democracies is his assumption that citizens are morally motivated to be democratic citizens, yes. right? The problem is that it seems to me under modern conditions of market capitalism, market democracy, there's a real question whether or not liberal democracies like the United States, England, is, are, 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 have lost the ability to reproduce the morality necessary to sustain self-government. I mean, how else do you explain the election of Trump? I mean, I think this is a serious problem for political philosophers. Rawls just assumes that we all have the capacity to be reasonable. He calls them, you know, we need to be reasonable and we need to be rational. Reasonable is our ability, essentially, to act to be other regarding, to regard others as equal, and their interest to be the equal as, 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 as morally valuable as our own, and that we're rational and that we can conceive of goals and we can pursue them, pursue them well. If you, have, if you have a society that lacks people who are reasonable, they're all egoists, Yes. right? It's a mad society, right? And so I feel like we're quickly going into that direction yes. because we're losing the ability to be other regarding because the sources of other regarding, teaching people how to be other regarding, are being destroyed. I mean, religion is an important source, regardless of Islam, Christianity, and all religions teach us to be other regarding. Yes. <clears throat> but we literally don't have time even to be religious, most of us, right? regardless of the religion we follow, right? Um, we don't have time to read philosophy. If, you know, if you're a secularist, right, you don't want religion, but you gotta have philosophy, you gotta have some source of, of, of morality that will teach you to be reasonable on, on Rawls' terms. But if you look at universities today, students don't want to study humanities because everything is reinforcing the lesson that humanities are worthless, Gosh. right? So I think there's a real crisis what we have in, in, in liberal okay. democracies because it's not, the, the moral basis of self-government is being taken away from society. Can I introduce perhaps a controversial uh, and slightly off-color note here? Um, the title of this is Do What Thou Wilt? Question mark. And, and as has been said already, this is the creed of a Satanist, 
Mm. And I use that word in its technical sense rather than a pejorative sense, he's a bad person. Uh, Alistair Crowley, a fellow Englishman. <laughs> um, the reason I mention this is that, is it not possible, and this is a controversial bit, to argue, and I think maybe Sheikh Hamza Yusuf has alluded to this actually, with perhaps some quite insightful comments, that behind the, the evident, the scene, as you, are, you have so eloquently described, the forces of market capitalism and the, the lack of altruism in our ethical interactions with people and the breakdown of normative value, absolutely, I'm not denying that, of course. But also, is there not an unseen realm of occult power, of influence, therefore, satanic influence? Uh, as Muslims or Christians, and uh, you know, we believe in shaitan, Satan, the devil, whatever. And Alistair Crowley was very much in alignment with that ideology, this kind of egocentric, my desire is my God. You know, there's a verse in the Quran that speaks about the man who makes his own desires his God. So could it be said, in fact, in addition to your own apparent, you know, in terms of the external causes, which are real, we have another unseen element or dimension to this whole issue of a satanic uh, perspective. I, I don't mean this as a metaphor, by the way. I mean this as a hard metaphysical uh, reality. And this is not normally spoken of in ethics, is it? You know, the influence of the devil. But, <laughs> it, it, but maybe it should be, because we're talking about individual lives here who are being influenced by the zeitgeist, which apparently is an expression of Alistair Crowley's philosophy. So we are living under this regime, it, would, uh, it could be argued. I mean, is this fanciful, or would you see something to that, both of you? Oh, I think that, that I mean, that's just simply factual, that we are, we are um, subject to the uh, agency of the devil. Um, he doesn't have any real power over us, but he has apparent power over us if we don't protect ourselves properly. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, I, th I think there are, I mean, that's a kind of, in a way, a different level of metaphysical causation to, you know, what is up to us and we can deal with on this level, which is the rational level. Sure, you know, he's definitely at work, you know, very, very deep down in people. Right. Um, and there are several verses in the Quran which speak to that. I mean, for example, one of the things that uh, Satan likes to do is to inspire people to change uh, God's cre creation. Well, they're going to. Uh, that's yes. the sort of thing we're they have seeing to... this precisely this attempt to, in various aspects of our lives. Right, yeah, and the yeah, thing yeah. is that that has a rational um, manifestation. And you know, I feel that the phenomenon that. Uh, Dr. Muhammad is talking about um, was 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 referring to, which is you might call the crisis of liberal legitimacy today. Um, I don't know whether we differ on that, but uh, but you know I, I think that's basically inevitable. Um, it's 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 a it's been a long time in the making, but I think it was basically inevitable given yes. the philosophies of modernity. One of the the uh, uh, and the fundamental empiricism and and. Um, metaphysical reductionism that you find in most of the theorists of, of modern liberalism. Um, and I think it, it manifests in, even in, in rules, because you know, when you have this idea of the priority of rights over the good, and that one of the most fundamental functions of a liberal society is to is simply, to is non-interference in protecting the right of people to pursue their own visions of the good, right? To, to, pursue, to define and pursue their own visions of the good. Um, I think there's a, there's a fundamental arbitrarism there, which is that it's impossible then to order goods. It's, a, it, it's impossible to order one good over another. Mm. It also, there's a, there's a, a conundrum, a, which is, this is widely discussed, which is, what is that prescription itself? Isn't that a definition of the good? The idea that autonomy itself is the ultimate good. Yes. And there are some thinkers like Joseph Raz, who are you know, liberal perfection, a perfectionism, who think that actually autonomy itself is that good, which, which everyone has to be um, held accountable to. Um, you know, that, that is the good that, that, that we seek. That is the end that, that is sought um, he, and that has Quran, to be imposed upon yeah. everyone. I mean, in the Quran, it's not so much that freedom is lauded as a great virtue. It's, it's justice, for example. It seems to be a very serious virtue in, in the Quran. Justice is, but freedom is a very important virtue. I mean, yeah. Imam al-Ghazali, I was just reading, reading in Mizan al-Amal, it's one of the texts that I'm very unworthily teaching at Zaytuna, um, and he said, al-hur fi al-tahqiq 
man qahara shahwatahu. Right? He said the, the, the free person, yeah, in the final analysis, the free person is actually the person who has overcome and defeated his, his desire. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And I think this, this is a, I mean, freedom is very, this is, that's the t a type of definition that you'll find. There's some very interesting definitions. Yes. Freedom is very important to our tradition. To be yes. a mukallaf, so that's not freedom to sin, that's freedom from sin. Freedom from that, the, the controlling nafs, isn't it? And that's that, freedom from the controlling nafs and, and putting, and that's what I mean by hierarchy. It's not, you know, some sort of imposition on people. It's right. the fact that within, we find a, a hierarchy within ourselves. Yes. We right. don't want to be enslaved to impulse. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you, 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 if we're sort of shifting now to talk about the Islamic tradition, I mean, I think you find both a commitment to the positive view of freedom that you just talked about with Imam Ghazali, but also a very strong commitment to negative freedom. Mm. Negative yeah. freedom, legitimate negative freedom, and even the negative freedom of sinners, right? So, yeah. first of all, in Islamic law, um, as a general rule, the idea of interfering in the rights of another person is completely not, ex not accepted. Right? That's considered a really major violation of your rights. You know, if you find, you know, somebody might be doing stupid things, right? But if it's not illegal, you're not supposed to be able to stop that person from doing it. So again, Ibn Abdul Salam <coughs> says, Hajrul mar'i an al istiqlal bi manafa nafsihi mafsada. Right? This is, you know, this is a principle of fiqh. So rights, rights bearers. That's what it means to be a right bearer, is that you get to pursue those rights as you wish, as long as you're not doing anything illegal, mm. right? So the principle of non-interference is very, very important in fiqh. Secondly, Imam Qarafi has an interesting um, commentary on the hadith that, you know, teach your children to pray at seven, and if they don't pray, at, I think at ten, you can beat them. He says, well, if, you, if, if he's ten years old and he's not praying and you beat him, and he still doesn't pray, Right? You don't keep beating him. <laughs> right? Because it's a principle of punishment that the punishment has to be effective, mm, right. has to achieve some aim. And if the if the ten year old continues not praying, beating him clearly no longer is a, is, is is serving it's a corrective it's function. It yeah. becomes gratuitous. Yeah. And gratuitous violence is not part of the Sharia. Right? And so there's a certain amount of balance between, to use a Rousseauian term, forcing us to be free and then taking our responsibility as individuals to cultivate the virtues necessary to, be, to, be, to achieve self-mastery, right? And that requires a certain kind of negative freedom. Mm. So Imam Shatabi again says in the, in the, in the Muafaqat and Kitab al-Maqasid that we're all the slaves of God. Yeah. and by necessity. Yeah. But it's the aim of the lawgiver that we choose to be God's servants, that we right. become God's servants, ikhtiyaran, right? And that's part of the art of politics, is that the ruler understands what the population is capable of living up to. So he reports an anecdote involving Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, who's considered one of the wise caliphs, and his son supposedly was berating him for his laxity in enforcement of the law. And he, told, and he replied to his son, you know, the problem is if I try to compel people to behave properly all at once, they might abandon the truth all yeah. at once. Right? And his son mm. was sort of expressing kind of deontic enthusiasm, let's say. Mm. Right? And Amr ibn al <laughs> says that's not how a successful ruler rules. You rule by, you know, understanding what the people are capable of obeying freely. And then you sort of raise them over time. This was part of Shatabi's argument that the Sharia becomes grounded in the community gradually over time. Right. As they learn, as they assimilate it, internalize it. Right? And so there's always this risk politically. And you see this with regimes that view themselves as transformative of human nature, that they, turn, they devolve into tyrannies, 
Yes, like the Soviet Union, the, the new Soviet man who yeah. would become this new ontological being who, who, as you said, the Soviet Union just becomes a tyranny. And, and yeah. so, you know, uh, Shatavi is very worried about that, yeah. right? And he talks about istitness, the, the need to sort of domesticate the norms of the Sharia, which can only be acquired gradually over time in the lives of the subject of the, uh, in the lives of the legal subject, right? Um, so you've got to have a balance between law as a, as a um, sort of vehicle that uplifts people, brings them, raises them up, and law as a tool that protects them from the interference of others. You need to have both. You need to have a proper balance of both. I mean, there's an amazing story, I think it was a hadith that I, when I first discovered as a, a new Muslim, it really impressed me. I think there was a story of a, a companion who was uh, at home, in his courtyard, you know, the wall around it, and it, there were some noises from within the house that suggested he might be partying and so on. And so a companion <laughs> peeped over and uh, looked and uh, threatened to denounce him or basically expose him as a, a transgressor. And, and in fact, uh, when he attempted to do so, he was rebuked because oh. the privacy aspect was actually, the, you know, whatever this guy was doing at home was private, even That's if it was really wrong. Important. And yeah. to spy on someone. Yeah, uh, what yeah. was was the far worse offence in that particular context, and I thought, well, wow, that's a very sophisticated understanding of negative freedom, as you were describing it. That's precisely what I was going to say in in um, an agreement with Dr. Muhammad's words. Um, the famous story, and there there are many others. The famous narration um, about Sayyidina Ahmad, who was who was going around Medina doing his hisba activity, just making everything, uh, making sure everything's all right. Um, and they heard, you know, it's, it's, it's late at night and they hear people partying, basically, yes. you know, yes. loud, you know, <laughs> reveling noises yeah. and the clink of glasses and things like that. And they actually see through a jar, uh, there's a door which is a jar, and they actually see people drinking. Wow. They actually see Muslims drinking. And he says to his companion, you know, what do you think we should do? And, and the companion says, I think that, you know, his advisor says, I think we should, we should leave because... You know, we've been spying. You right. know, this, this is covered by Walata Jessus, who, yes. you know, it's actually, because we peered in the door, even though there's so much overwhelming evidence, we'd actually be guilty of transgression yes. uh, of spying. And this is a Sharia principle, isn't it? It's not some kind of... You know, this is a very uh, fundamental yeah. Sharia principle, but it, you know, it, it um, ties into something which I think is really relevant to the broader context, which is just this idea, look, you know, in Islam... Actually, you are free to pursue your own vision of the good. You know, under the regime of Islam in the broadest sense, you are free to pursue your own vision of the good. What you're not free to do is to uh, pursue that, to, to pursue sin publicly. Right, <coughs> publicly. You're this is free to do. pursue it privately because th there's, there's a prohibition of to justice. I mean, that, that's not, no one needs to tell you that. You're a human. You can do what you want. You can get away with it. Yeah, you can. You can you, <laughs> yeah. That's the, the human condition. But not ultimately, of course, because God is watching at all times. So this is a legal point, I guess, rather than a, than a metaphysical point, because we're not. Uh, we're always observed. Well, well, this is the issue. You know, yeah. if you look at the way that, for example, homosexuality was legalized in private in the UK, yes. right, in about 1959, uh, late 50s. First, there was the Wolfenstein Committee, yes. which. Um, uh, weighed up, you know, wh how we should deal with this in terms of legislation. And there were two major participants in the paper. There was Devlin yes. and there was Hart. And Hart was arguing that, no, it should remain, it should remain illegal. And, and, uh, and, and, and Hart was, Devlin was, was arguing for that, and Hart was arguing based on invoking the harm principle. And in their eventual recommendation that it should be legalized... Or de de decriminalized, I think de yeah, sorry, decriminalized. Yeah, decriminalized. Yeah, sorry, decriminalized. The the uh, they 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 explicitly invoked uh, again invoking a philosopher. They explicitly invoked Mill's harm principle. Right. Um, now Devlin tried to. Now, in the first place, that was supposed to be in private, right? Yes. Now if that's really that's you said to get not in private. That's yeah. already taken care of in. In, uh, in Islam in the first place. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in England, they used to, knock, they used to literally beat down the doors yes. um, in order to discover people. So that's why it was relevant in that yes, sense. Yes. But what's subsequently happened is obviously 
the, as you say, the, the, the obligatory morality that we all are forced to say, you know, it has to become our credo. You know, I believe the, the sacred orthodoxy of the zeitgeist, one of which is um, that uh, homosexuality and heterosexuality are formally equivalent because they are basically just the objects of people's wills. They are their own conception of the good and who are we to say that one is superior to the other? And that is the, that's the ultimate consequence of um, there not being a criterion for the good, yes. right? There only <laughs> being a conception of rights, yes. right? So we have, the, the, any, you know, human beings have a right to privacy and they have a right ultimately before God because they're answerable to God. If they're just in God's presence and no one's watching them, they can do whatever they want. That's the, that's the human condition. But what you don't have a right to do is to bring it into public and promote it. Yes. as somehow something equivalent to, to other options which are normative. So, you know, I think that is, again, a fundamental... This is, you know, what we mean fundamentally by hierarchy, that there, there, is, there, there, there is a nature of things, there is an order of being, and there, there, there's, an, there's an objective ordering in goods as well, of goods. Um, so I just thought that was a that's, a... that's a very interesting debate, the one between Devlin and Hart, because... Hart, obviously Hart and the, the, and the decriminalization side ultimately wins out. I'm not saying that they shouldn't have. As I said, that <coughs> principle in a way is already there in Islam, that yes. right to privacy. But what I'm saying is it's interesting if you look at um, the attempts that were made to argue for the opposite position, because of the deterioration breakdown of any form of metaphysically root, rooted philosophical ethics, all he could invoke was custom. He said, well, this is a Christian country and legislation to take, should take into consideration you know, the customs of a country. You know, it was, he was saying al-adda muhakkama, basically. And um, you know, custom has the power of law, which is an Islamic principle. And, um, and so you know, it, we should take into consideration the fact that most people would um, disagree with this. Um, you know, that, yes. the, the position of the average man in the street is relevant. Well, the funny thing is that is to invoke complete relativism because the position of the average man in the street today is the exact opposite. And it's also highly, manipulative, highly open to be manipulated by media and, and so on. So it's, it's not a stable, unchanging phenomenon. But, but perhaps we need to move on as time is mm. pressing on us. Uh, my penultimate uh, question, really, as we draw to a close, gentlemen, can you sum up the main points of your respective positions. I think there is a difference, but although you're being very amicable, uh, <laughs> uh, which is uh, very interesting, but uh, could you perhaps just summarize your, your, your views on this? And then we'll, and the final question basically is to, uh, uh, if people want to explore these issues, ideas further, uh, what articles or books would you recommend that we read? So it's kind of, there's the final two questions. So Mahalo, yeah, perhaps. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm not quite so convinced that liberalism is vacuous. Um, I mean, again, I, 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 I'm not a philosopher. Uh, I, I, I know liberalism through Rawls, and Rawls's conception of how a politically liberal society can be stable depends on the idea that there are certain substantive moral values that are held in common by different traditions. I think this is very important, that maybe sort of traditional political philosophy rooted the stability of a just regime in the populace sharing one ethical conception of the good. Rawls believes, and I'm sympathetic to this belief, at least in the West, is that that idea of, of a moral unity of the people is sociologically unrealistic. And there has to be a different, a different explanation or a different um, route to, to, liberal, to, to stability. His argument is that you can have a pluralism of commitments that nevertheless share certain goods in common. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Right. And I think actually that that is a is a very clever argument. And I also think it happens to have the the virtue of being true. I think a lot of I think the major ethical traditions of the world, whether philosophical or religious, do converge on really, really important values. What concerns me is that he kind of assumed, I think, unrealistically, 
that this kind of um, the ethical commitments of the people will just stay, will just survive, sort of by, I don't know, by, 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 by uh, what's, what's the word in physics? Um, inertia, right? right? But I, I think he really underestimated the destructive power of market capitalism, because market capitalism is all about hewa. Mm. It's all about hewa. It's all about immediate gratification of desire. And no philosopher is going to endorse that. Right? Certainly, I mean, Rawls wouldn't endorse that. You can't be a reasonable person in, in Rawls's conception if, you, if your most important personality trait is gratification, immediate gratification of desire. Right? So I think there's got, you know, from a practical perspective, we can't save liberal democracy. The, the threat to liberal democracy is not the absence of a common theory of the good. It's that unrestrained market capitalism destroys our capacity to adopt any conception of the good right. mm. for the average person because we're too busy consuming. Yeah, no, that's very profound. Hassan? Um, I, I, I very fundamentally agree with, doc, uh, agree with Dr. <coughs> Muhammad. I, I think... Um, Rawls, as so many other uh, thinkers who appeared at a certain moment in history, they didn't realize that they were really banking on the survival of what was really a fundamentally a, a Christian Victorian ethic yeah, so the, that would just by default Yeah, they were living off that capital, the heritage of capital, which it, was already dissipating by secularization. Precisely, yeah. and, and I, I do believe that um, our problem um, in today's world in so many different areas is the loss of metaphysics, and it really is that there was a, if you don't have Christian belief to fall upon, um, in which let's say, you know, at least you, you have fear of punishment in, a, in an afterlife or, um, or, or, or reward or, or hope for reward in an afterlife, which was what Locke, if you get past his ethical arbitrism when it comes to pure philosophy, that's what he ends up leaning upon is that that's the only way to get people to, to act morally. Otherwise, as far as he's concerned, you know, the, the, the philosophers of old did in vain inquire whether summum bonum is whatever it happens to be. Oh, you I'm, may as well yeah. decide, you know, you may as well you know, ask whether lobsters and che or cheese are better because, <laughs> you know, just that while they're, you know, wonderful, fair to some individuals, they're absolutely repugnant to others. Yeah. And it, that was his view of, 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 of ultimately on our ethical judgments. Um, and you, know, you, f you find that in, in, in the book on, on power in his, um, in his uh, famous essay. So um, yeah, that, that's what it comes down to, is an ultimate arbitrism because of his empiricism. How do you order moral and ethical goods in a metaphysically grounded way if you're fundamentally an empiricist? But it's interesting, uh, even John Locke, them? the great John Locke, who influenced, mm. I understand, the United States Constitution in, in, some, in some ways, was really against atheists. I mean, they would have no, they were not permitted to... to they to were the only people, atheism. yeah, atheists and Catholics couldn't be tolerated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great apostle of freedom, well, but yeah. yeah he is, I mean, again, uh, Locke is a divine command theory mm. fellow, right? Uh, you know, that, that at the end he believes that the only thing that grounds, grounds ethics is, uh, is, to, is the divine command. Right. Um, and so, anyway. Okay, so my second uh, question finally was, uh, if people want to explore uh, your thought or these ideas further, what would you recommend in terms of articles or books for people to read? I don't know, <laughs> it's hard for me to say, I don't know. Um, because you've written all this, obviously. I've, I've well, read some of them. I'd recommend Dr. Fuddle's some of yes, his some of his articles. articles. <laughs> that's a, I just Google his name and you can read some articles. One's on Renovatio, so that's very easy. <laughs> that's very easy. Yes, in, in the House Journal of Zaytuna, you have actually written some articles, so that's a good place to start. Unless you had some. I mean, I, I think Rawls is very accessible. Uh, Oh. Uh, political liberalism revisited. Uh, political liberalism revisited is an article, but I find actually his the book political liberalism, uh, just the introduction even to be quite accessible, um, and it's important I think for Muslims living in liberal societies to understand the basic architecture of of, of liberal political philosophy. Um, I mean because that's the governing ideology, right, right. and. Uh, 
you know, I don't read as much as I used to. I don't have, I, I've got so much time. I have to read for my writing for purposes of research. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Yes. And I think there are a lot of valuable podcasts that bring writers and scholars. And um, I encourage people to find good podcasts. Uh, just the political theory podcast, which I listen to um, others as well, uh, including Islamic studies. There's the new books in Islamic studies podcast, all these things. You need to, you know, to be a, I think, a, a high-functioning Muslim citizen in, in the United States, in Canada, or England. <laughs> you just, you know, you have to be really well-read, yeah. I think. And so I encourage people to increase their Islamic knowledge and increase their secular knowledge. Gosh, that sounds like good advice. Thank you. Hassan? Uh, I recommend blogging theology. Oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I gave him a 10 quid earlier to say that, so thank you. Uh, uh, I have just finished doing the bibliography for my book, which is in press at the moment, so um, do look out for it. But uh, it's, um, it's you know, what, one definite recommendation is Brad Gregory's The Unintended Reformation, absolutely fantastic oh. book, um, which just talks about how the, what started out as a, a very, very religious, indeed, um, uh, religious revolution, um, Really, I mean, it's, he traces the emergence of, sec, of, uh, of secularism from um, the, the, the Protestant Revolution, and you know, of course, Martin Luther, uh, the Two Kingdoms, which is often seen. Yeah, of course, yeah, the Two yeah. Kingdoms, and then you know, culminating in the, the Peace of Augsburg and the Peace of Westphalia, and then the emergence of the modern um, nation state, and so yeah. on, and, and you know, then the doctrine of tolerance in yeah. in, uh, in in Locke, which which of course not apart not, from atheists and Catholics, but yeah, apart from know. atheists and Catholics, which not everyone yeah. knows, you know, is founded in his epistemological skepticism. Since we can't know the truth of the matter, it would be unjust for us to impose any one vision on. So you know, there are a lot of, of of dogmatic assumptions parading as neutrality, which may not be. And that's, you know, these are all open to contention. But I'm just saying, you know, look into that. The Unintended Reformation, um, uh, other works, um, I would definitely rep recommend Robert Pippin's uh, Modernism as a Philosophical Problem. That's a fantastic, absolutely fantastic work. Uh, if you've got a lot of time on your hands or you just, you're a very, you know, you, you, you're, you're looking for the long haul then read um, Taylor's A Secular Age. Oh. Uh, it's about like 9,000 pages or something, but it's, uh, <laughs> it just never ends. This is a very, very long haul flight yeah. from, from here to where we are. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Australia or something. Australia, but, yeah. but, uh, but that's a very, very worthwhile book. Um, his Sources of the Self. Um, I can't pronounce his name. It might be Schneewind or something, but it's The Invention of Autonomy. I hope he forgives oh. me for pronouncing his name like that, but the invention of autonomy for a really detailed history. Um, After Virtue is a oh, favourite here at, Another at, at Zaytuna, thanks to Dr. Umar, our provost's yeah. leadership, he's, he's established After Virtue. It's a very important text right. as, a, as a key text. And of course, you, I mean, you're probably familiar with the, the argument of After Virtue, which is that we're in a complete mess um, in terms of uh, morality and, and, and moral language. And, um, you know, modernity is prescribing forms of morality, suggesting forms of, of morality and ethics for us, which it's also suggesting we can't possibly take seriously. So it's this kind of um, contradiction. Okay, well, I'm going to recommend a book that I've nearly finished myself. It's just been published called Islam, Liberalism and Ontology, a critical re-evaluation uh, by Joseph J. Kaminsky, who's a, a professor, he's actually American uh, professor, uh, published by Routledge Studies in Religion and Politics. It covers much of the ground that we've covered. Mm. Uh, it has very definite conclusions, though, but it's a very scholarly work, and uh, I recommend that, Islam, Liberalism and Ontology. And with that, we will conclude. Thank you very much Thank indeed you very much. to you too. And Thank you, Paul. Uh, a round of applause. Great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.